The theme of this morning's service that's splashed across the top of the bulletin is a bit of a slippery slope. I'll read it to you, but watch your step. The Spirit of Jesus sends witnesses. Okay, what's so slippery about that? What, what dangerous territory might we fall into by embracing that idea that the Spirit sends witnesses? Well, if we could ask Paul and Barnabas, they'd have something to say about it. In fact, Paul did talk about it in 2 Corinthians at length, listing all the ways that he suffered for the gospel. He'd been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, jailed, and more. But that's not the danger I'm speaking of. I mean a danger that sounds like the opposite of suffering. It's the danger of honor, recognition, and respect. But before we go there, let's take a couple steps back. To start with the story from the start of this story from Acts, where Paul and Barnabas were chosen by the Spirit and sent by the Spirit and the church to be witnesses. Guess where that happens? In the same community that we've talked about a lot this winter in our study of Matthew, Antioch of Syria. But this is a very different time. Matthew's gospel emerged in that community around or after 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman Empire. So we read that gospel in light of the severe trauma that the Jewish and Christian community there had endured together. But by the time the Gospel of Matthew was written down and shared with the church, the Apostle Paul was already dead and gone. The story from Acts happens a full 25 years earlier, a whole generation before Matthew was compiled. So what was the church at Antioch like at this earlier time, around 45 AD thereabouts? We don't have many details. But we can speculate, based on what we know about early church life, that the group of Jesus followers in Antioch that commissioned Paul and Barnabas and sent them out as witnesses was a lively and diverse group of people, most of whom were practicing Jews and members of the local synagogue, but also included Gentile believers. Paul, as you might recall, was a zealous Pharisee who actively persecuted Jesus' followers, and he was transformed when he met Jesus in a vision on the road to Damascus, and then he spent a whole decade being discipled into a Jesus follower himself. Most of that was in Jerusalem, but eventually he landed in Antioch of Syria, and there he and Barnabas were among a cohort of gifted and educated young believers living in a community where Jewish and Gentile Jesus followers coexisted, attempting to build a vibrant faith community there. That's the context for the beginning of today's scripture. The believers in Antioch sensed by the Holy Spirit, that Paul and Barnabas were being called to go out to other communities around the empire where the scattered Jews, the diaspora, were living and trying to make a life in a highly Greek culture. So the believers in Antioch fasted and prayed and laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them off to preach the good news. Now we skipped over the part of chapter 13 where Paul and Barnabas ran into resistance immediately. Some welcomed their message, but others, threatened by it, stirred up the people and they got run off time and again once with an attempted stoning. Now, given Paul's history as a persecutor himself, that shouldn't have surprised him, 
But then they got to Lystra, and their fortunes changed dramatically. They met a a man lame from birth and then let the Holy Spirit work through them and the man sprang up and walked and the crowds swarmed on them. But instead of rushing at them with stones, they rushed at them with flowers. They thought they were gods, come to them in human form. Crowds were ready to make sacrifice to Barnabas as Zeus and to Paul as Hermes. And the children this morning already showed us this wonderful and chaotic scene. You know what I find so remarkable about this story? Not the healing itself. Not even the outpouring of love and adoration by the crowds. Those things you might expect in reading Acts. What I don't necessarily expect especially when I lay this story alongside the history of Christian mission in the West, is how Paul and Barnabas responded to this outpouring of honor and admiration. They instantly threw a fit. They mounted a loud public protest. They tore their clothing, it says the ultimate act of desperation and public humility, all in response to them being loved and adored. Their loud refrain was, no, no, don't think this way. We are just like you. That's exactly what they said. We are just like you. Wow. What if those were the words that Christian missionaries were known for throughout the history of the church? We are just like you. No, don't treat us any different. We are human like you. Our needs and desires and rights and worth are no more important than your needs and desires and rights and worth. The global family of Jesus followers would look very different today, I think, if that had been our Christian mission history. My grandparents, who I loved and respected deeply, were missionaries in India from the late 1920s to the early 1940s. And they operated out of a model that was handed to them. In the core of their being, I know, they were humble and compassionate and self-giving people. And I've been told personally by some Indian Mennonites who remember them, that Loy and Elizabeth Niss had a reputation of being kind, approachable, and willing to get down in the dirt with their neighbors, unlike some other American missionaries. Nevertheless, my grandparents did what their predecessors did. They moved into a gated missionary compound, already there from the previous missionaries, built seven years earlier by our Mennonite mission board. They lived in that large cement house with tile roof, larger and safer and more comfortable by far than any homes for miles around. I have that 90-year-old panoramic photo of their house and compound on the wall of my home office as a reminder of where I came from. A missionary compound in those days was more than a home. It was a base of operations from which missionaries dispensed services. Services that our mission board deemed were needed. Bible lessons, English lessons, hygiene lessons, medicine, and much more. 
It was primarily a one-way transaction. We have what you need, and we are here to give it to you. And like the people in Lystra, many of the local people related to missionaries like gods in human form. They didn't literally bow down in worship, but they did lower themselves in deference because clearly these Americans were not the kind of human beings they were. The local population was indeed poor and lacked adequate health care. The missionaries seemed mysterious and transcendent, unimaginable wealth and resources at their fingertips. They could make the sick well. They could build strong buildings. They could make things happen. I'm grateful today that our mission agencies think differently. MCC, <clears throat> Mennonite Mission Network, VM Missions, for the most part, would be abhorred by the idea of sending people into a new setting like some God deserving reverence. I know of a number of young families today connected to our mission agencies living in other countries and cultures with their children, and they've been there for many years, just living out their lives of faith, building relationships, learning from their hosts. Grace and Hugo in Indonesia, for instance, were just here sharing their story a few weeks ago, working alongside slum residents and living with them. And there are many other examples, many, many, through their lives and their words, this generation of mission workers are saying, kind of like Paul and Barnabas, we are just like you. <clears throat> we have the same needs. We have the same human struggles. Let's learn together how to overcome them. Show us how to build homes like yours. Show us how to eat food like yours. Teach us your language. Teach us your ways. Share your wisdom with us. And then maybe later, we'll share ours with you. And together, we'll see where it leads. <clears throat> but you know, this, this sermon today is not just about our theology and practice of global mission. It hits a lot closer home. It applies wherever we get involved in the lives of others. Be they our co-workers, our neighbors, the immigrant community in Harrisonburg, the unhoused, those dealing with food insecurity, those with chronic mental illness, and yes, the children and families in our North Parkview Church neighborhood that we meet through Kids Club or block parties or what have you, we should always be asking ourselves, does the message we're sending sound anything like we have what you need, what you've been waiting for even though you didn't know it? Or is it more like the refrain of Paul and Barnabas, we are just like you. Just like you. We need you as much as you need us. We need each other to be whole. The Jesus that we try to emulate came as Emmanuel, God with us, God like us, God that identifies with us. If that's who we worship and follow, shouldn't we live with that very same posture of deep humility? 
No matter what our interactions with our neighbors or with each other, we should always be doing whatever we can to identify with the other, not to distance from the other. And may God help us do that. Please join me in a prayer of confession, if you will. God without whom nothing. We owe all we are and all we have to you. Our identity comes from you. Our vocation comes from you. Forgive our self-doubt. Forgive us our self-worship. Grace us with humility and confidence. May we live as unassuming servants who know their inestimable worth. Lord, we are your servants. Go where God sends you. Remember who you are. Bear witness to the good news to all who are ready to receive it.